Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MMA Island podcast. I am Jack Kennedy alongside Kayla McNamara and Hunter Boss. A loaded podcast for you today. Episode 50 of the MMA Island podcast. Pretty Ooh. crazy. Or, uh, it's a very significant episode. A lot to talk about. I'm Jack Kennedy. And they hit a lot harder, in my opinion, too. What is up, everybody? My name is Kayla McNamara, and everyone's got a plan until they get hit with my views. I am Hunter Boss. He just wanted to go to the distance by the looks of it. But he couldn't even do that. And this is the MMA Island Podcast. Um, we'll get it kicked off with some fight news. Marvin Vittori is going to be facing Israel Adesanya for the middleweight championship at UFC 263. Um, Hunter, starting with you, what do you make of this fight? This fight kind of surprised us all. We were all kind of thinking Robert Whitaker would get the uh, next title shot, which he will be getting, Dana White has said. It's just going to be Marvin Vittori versus, Rob, or versus Israel Adesanya first. That's going to be happening June 12th, UFC 263. It's going to be a pretty interesting fight to say the least you know they fought once previously i think it was uh izzy's ufc debut and uh it was a really close fight it was a split decision victory for israel Nasaya. so this fight is about a lot more than just retaining the belt it's about who really won that first fight uh, the first time around but both these fighters are so much better than they were that first time around too so this will be a fun fight to watch stylistically because marvin Vittori, we've seen He's getting a lot better on his feet, but his wrestling is still elite. While Israel Nasai's striking has gotten a lot better, but and his wrestling is getting a little bit better and better. But we've also seen his past fight. He's susceptible to these takedowns we've seen by Jan Bohovic. So is this going to take a part, uh, a role in the fight? We're not going to know until we see it June 12th. But you can bet everyone's going to be tuning in to watch this. This is going to be a very entertaining fight. Yeah, I agree with Hunter's first point. Um, Surprised us all, really. You know, I was adamant it was Whitaker that was next. We did find out that apparently Whitaker was offered the fight, but he simply couldn't take it. Personally, I still think it's an undeserved fight. You know, I don't see what you justify for Vittori that you don't for Derek Brunson on the basis of how you got the fight in question, but it's happening, so we just have to deal with it. Um, It's going to be a good fight. Um, Like Hunter said, you know, Vittori's gotten a lot better since the first fight, but of course, Adesanya's made leaps and bounds. You know, he's probably the most dangerous fighter at 185 right now outside of Robert Whitaker. It's probably Adesanya 1, Whitaker 2, and then the rest. Um, yeah, if this fight goes to the ground, I would have concerns for Adesanya just because of what Jan Blakovic showed. Now, granted, there are differences in considering that, such as weight and so on and so forth, but the signs are there. That being said, getting out of Sanya down is a completely different question. And he's probably got the best takedown defense in the middleweight division. And for good reason, too. Expect out of Sanya to keep this standing. And I see an out of Sanya finish personally. Yeah, I, I like that. I like that. I I was disappointed, to be honest, to hear this. I mean, nothing is uh, Vittori. He's fought well, but I didn't agree with him jumping over Derek Brunson in the rankings. In my opinion, Derek Brunson had an even more impressive performance over Kevin Holland than Vittori did. Uh, I, I, I don't think he should have jumped to three over five. Um, and honestly, I mean, Vittori has really jumped in the rankings very fast, if you think about it. He beat Jack Hermanson, um, and then he beat, uh, obviously, Kevin Holland, and now he's number three. So th- make that of what you will. I don't think he's beat the most elite competition at 185. Um, and you have to be showing that you're beating the most elite competition, especially at a weight class like that, in order to get a title shot. In my opinion, I, I agree with you, Keelan. I think Adesanya has improved so much um, since since he last fought Vittori. I, I, I could be wrong. I think that was Vittori's debut in the UFC as well. I think they were uh, – fighting each other on their debut. So very close, but Adesanya just, he, he's a, he's a whole different animal right now. Yeah. He lost it to, to Jan Blakovich, but how amazing is Jan Blakovich? How smart of a fighter he is and how much bigger he is than Adesanya. Adesanya is still king of 185. And I just don't think, I just don't think Vittori has the, the tool set to beat him, to be honest. I mean, he looked very, one of the things that he has been improving on. And one of the things that I think I would like to see in the future, which is why I, I'm not too crazy about this fight being booked right now, is Vittori striking. And I think that got exposed in the fight against Kevin Holland because he could not stand up with him. And you're going to have to stand up with Adesanya for at least a little bit 
if you're going to fight him. You have to be able to fight a chess match with Adesanya because if you're just going for one thing, he'll time it just like he did Derek Brunson and beat you. That's why Blakovich was able to win because he was able to fight him technically on the feet and then get him to the ground and win it there. Two different things. I don't think Vittori can stand on the feet with him, and I think he's just going to be going for the ground game. And Vittori is not – I mean, he's a very, very, very good wrestler. He's not elite, though. And whenever you have a guy like Asanya who can time that and defend the takedowns, I think he's going to pick him apart on the feet and uh, get that momentum back and everything. And I think this is all really just setting up the Robert Whitaker fight. Um, I know Adesanya said he wanted the June fight, and that's why they're doing it because obviously Robert Whitaker can't be ready for another title fight after that war he just had with Kevin Gastelum. So um, I'm, I'm, it's it, it's a fun fight. We'll see what happens. There'll be a lot of build up, but at the end of the day, I, I just see another Adesanya uh, display um, at UFC 263. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Um, but when we look at the last fights for both uh, uh, Brunson and Vittori, this is no uh, means to give Vittori a title shot over Brunson. But if we just take a look at the fights before that, too, I think Brunson's on a four-fight win streak right now. Vittori's on a, a five-fight win streak. And both their last losses came to Izzy. But one of them was to split decision, and one of them was from knockout, right. I believe. Right. So I think this will sell the fight better than it would for Derek Brunson because you would be like, oh, avenge your loss, this type of thing. I mean, both would be avenge and loss, but this one was closer, I guess. So I think style, I mean, from from a pay-per-view stand- stance, uh, the Vittori move was smarter than the Brunson move, I feel like, but that does, doesn't mean, not everything's pay-per-view, you know? I think Brunson was equally as deserving, if not more, and uh, it happens, you know? it's it, it, We saw this Jorge rematch happen pretty right. quick, which is also, I feel like, another undeserving title fight. But um, yeah, we take a look at this fight. Uh, stylistically, I agree with everything that Jack said. There's just levels to this weight division. And Vittoria is on a very high level right now, but he's just not as high as Robert Whitaker and Israel Ansaia when it comes to striking and even just mixing and wrestling too. Uh, Whitaker has fought the best of wrestlers. He's fought Kelvin Gastelum, who is a very good wrestler. He fought Yoel Romero, which I would consider elite because of the Olympic status in this point. I agree. And... Uh, yeah, uh, Robert Whitaker for sure. He's going to get the next next shot after this, whoever wins this fight. So I, I, I'm not too disappointed in this. It's always fun to see Israel in the, in the octagon. I just feel like we wanted to see Whitaker even more. So I'm not complaining. Uh, I think this fight on paper seems like it's very advantageous, advantageous towards uh, uh, Israel. But um, we've seen in the past, Vittori can make things look sloppy and he can make things look like he can really drag Izzy into the dirt for this fight. I think that's what he's going to need to do. He can't keep things looking like beautiful and sharp and clean, everything like that. He's got to get gritty with this. He's got to take a strike to land another strike. He's going to do a lot. Of, he's he's going to have to have a lot of things cut out for him to work to win this fight. But I'm not saying it's impossible. He can definitely do this. Yeah, you know, I'm not I'm not in any way complaining that Adesanya is going to be in the octagon again. Every time he's in there, it's a spectacle one way or the other. The problem is, realistically speaking, there is no sense in making another middleweight title fight unless it includes Robert Whitaker. Because whether you put Vittori in there or you put Brunson in there, the road to the 185 crown goes through Whitaker and nobody else. So even if somehow one of those guys managed to beat Izzy, you know, there's no legitimacy really to the lineage of their title reign because it goes through Robert Whitaker. And, you know, I was just thinking there and I'm very intrigued to especially hear your guys' response on this. Why aren't either of these guys fighting someone like Jared Cannonier first? You know, let's throw a beast Follow of 185 there. in there. Yeah, and I let's, think it's, let's... It's probably just because Izzy wants to fight in June, and they just need to give someone up for this. You know, they need to... They have to if he wants to fight, they're going to give him the fight. They're, Dana White's not going to miss out on a pay-per-view opportunity for Izzy, you know? Yeah, I guess, but I do think these contenders at 185 need to prove themselves more. Agreed. And yeah. this is this is the problem with the very with the relatively thin division with a clear king at the top. These guys are putting together one two fight win streaks and they're being thrown straight into the lion's den. Their momentum and their credibility is being trashed and it's being they're being cycled to the back of the queue again. Let's actually have these guys fight the other top guys in their division first and build up the hype that way. You know, it's going to be a good fight of that. I have no doubt. But is there really much sense in making it? Because I think everybody would agree it's most likely that Adesanya is going to win this. And what does that do for Marvin Vittori anyway? The, pro- the thing... 
the issue that I have with a lot of title pictures and a lot of divisions is that there's no long-term thinking that goes into them. That's the angle I approach it from. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Ah, man, it's tough. I think, I think we kind of all agree. I, Hunter was talking about like Derek Brunson being more deserving than Vittori for the title shot and everything. But like, really, I, it, it's, it's Robert Whitaker is the guy that, that, that deserves it. So I feel like any of these fights is almost the UFC, not, not, obviously saying it, but wanting Adesanya versus Whitaker to happen. And they just need to throw a fight in there in between. And, and that's a dangerous thing to do. But I think, I mean, Adesanya obviously wants it. I just don't think anyone's on Adesanya's level. There's a very rare situation in, in, in any weight class where there are two or more fighters that are fighting at a championship level. Middleweight is one of those weight classes. I'd say 145 with Max Holloway is another one. Yeah. Um, Middleweight's one of those weight classes where Robert Whitaker is fighting at a championship level every single time he fights. Uh, he's fighting the top contenders and he's beating them like a champion, coming strong in the fourth and fifth rounds, going the distance, having extreme cardio, fighting intelligently. He's fighting at that championship level and he needs that fight against Adesanya. I think we all agree with that. Um, we don't quite riot yet because that fight is going to happen uh, as per Dana White or he, he should get the champion, whoever it is. Um, but I just I feel like this fight is almost unnecessary. And I know Israel Adesanya wants to fight, um, but I mean, it's almost I, I think it would almost do better if uh, if they if they told him just hold off a little bit, hold off a couple months um, and we'll just do Robert Whitaker down the road. Um, so more fight news now. And this one is a little bit unfortunate. TJ Dillashaw has had a massive cut over his eye. It's been a little bit infected. Um, and he's going to have to pull out against Corey Sanhagen. That fight is currently being rebooked. Hunter, what do you make of this news? It's heartbreaking. You know, I, I wanted to see TJ back in the octagon. I think we've all wanted to see TJ back in the octagon for a while now. He had a few failed drug tests uh, about two years ago now. And ever since the suspension was up, we've all been wondering who is he going to fight next. And I thought this was a pretty good return for a fight for him. But this uh, cut, if I, I can't like take away it too much from TJ for dropping out of this fight because the, the look of the cut looks like it might take a, more than a week or two to heal up. Like this is, it was gruesome. And if it's getting infected, we don't want these fighters to be in any more danger than they have to be when they step in the octagon. So, I mean, as, as, as heartbreaking as, as it is, uh, I think we just need to give him like another month, maybe two. And I think we'll see him back in there soon. So we can all look forward to uh, Cody Garbrandt and Rob Font, which is happening in about, I think, two weeks, three weeks. Yep. So yep. there's just a different bantamweight fight to look forward to, but it's, it's, it's sad to hear. And I think the co-main event for this fight, I think Michelle Watterson's fighting in it. It's not going to be a bad co event, so still tune into the fight night. Uh, it'll be good, and uh, yeah, it's just really unfortunate what happened. Yeah, it is unfortunate because it's a big fight, and sadly, it's being rescheduled now. Now, I must admit, from my own part, when the when I think it was Juan Archuleta, that's Dillashaw's training partner, he posted the picture of the two of them posing on Instagram, and that's where we first saw the picture of Dillashaw's eye. Now, because of the angle the photo was taken and the distance it was taken from, I thought it was actually a very small cut. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the perspective everybody else had. But, you know, I have my own opinions and TJ Dillashaw, they're very well known. But to his credit, when you zoom in on the eye, it is actually a very bad cut. So love him or hate him, you do have to understand that that's a legitimate injury. I mean, if I can, anybody can. So... Yeah, it is the right choice to make. It's not an easy choice. You know, it's certainly not a fun choice, but it is the correct one. You know, especially when we're living through COVID and so on and so forth, there is no point in putting guys in any more risk than they're already in just by fighting normally. So, yeah, it'll be rescheduled. I've heard for June. So at least we have that to look forward to. And as Hunter said, we have an excellent bantamweight fight in Cody Garbrandt and Rob Font two of my favorite 135ers going at it and that'll be an amazing fight to look forward to in its own right but yeah um we just have to wait and see when the dillashaw fights rescheduled for and look forward to that happening yeah yeah i'm 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 very excited for for the fight whenever it does happen i i think there's a lot of interesting stuff going into it uh, obviously it's devastating news to see that and I, they did they posted the close-up and it's uh one of those ones on instagram where you have to click see photo to see because mm -hmm. it is pretty gruesome so um uh, best wishes to tj dillashaw uh heal up and the fight will happen which is the important thing uh another thing that is is interesting to take into it this fight is 
with with the state of the bantamweight division right now, this fight doesn't need to happen as soon as possible because right. Algermain Sterling has taken his time getting ready to go uh, for that title rematch versus uh, versus Piotr Jan, um, and these guys, whoever wins this, is next in line. Um, so these the fight will happen in June ish or, or whenever um, whenever TJ is ready to go, um, and then we'll figure it out from there. But the title won't be figured by at least the end of the year, maybe going into next year. So there's a lot of time in between it. So at least from a title perspective, no one's losing out on an opportunity here. The fight's going to happen whenever it happens. So that is the little saving grace uh, where it is. But yeah, I mean, I wanted to see it on this fight night. It's still a good co-main event stepping up to a main event, but man, th- this main event, it's always disappointing when you have something that's this close and, and, then, and then it goes away. Um, I'm really looking forward to that Cody Garbrandt, Rob Font though. That fight's going to be amazing. Um, now looking back on it, we were spoiled with, with these band weights back to back and everything. So it's something had to go wrong. Um, hopefully that other main event can stay together. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, it's disappointing, but we'll get to see this, the fight soon, which is, uh, the important thing. Yeah. 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 You brought up a great point, Jack. Uh, this bantamweight division is in no rush really. Cause uh, we've heard talks that Aljamain Sterling probably won't make it back to the octagon until maybe even November, December possibly. And to see the fight, uh, the, uh, the fight happened in that month or either November or December, the championship fight for the rematch with Peter Yan. And then wait another few months and maybe there's a title shot again. And that's where the winner of Cody, uh, 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 TJ Dillashaw and uh, the Sand, Sandhagen, Corey Sandhagen would be happening. So it's really no rush for this fight to happen. So as soon as both fighters are like fully healed and they're ready, I would love to see them step in the octagon. I think we, once again, we were spoiled. We, I would love to see them step in the octagon. And I would love to see Cody Garbrandt fight. Like see both TJ Dillashaw and Cody Garbrandt and within like a month of each other, it would be perfect for me. But like Jack said, let's just hope nothing goes wrong with this Cody Garbrandt, Rob Font fight. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, I hope, let's hope I, my prayers go out to TJ Dillashaw. Hopefully that eye gets better. It looks like a really nasty cut. It, it did not look pretty whatsoever. So yeah. Yeah. That eye looks like it's a sort of nasty elbow injury from what I can see. If you look at the angle of the cut and the depth of it, it's, it is very nasty indeed. That being said, you know, I have my opinions in the San Hagen fight. I still in no way justify Dillashaw being straight in the title eliminator, you know, opinions or opinions on that but either way the fight's happening whether i like it or not so uh, we just have to wait for that to be rescheduled and look forward to it that being said i am praying to the mixed martial arts gods now that garbrandt and font goes ahead with nothing going oh, wrong because that is going to be a killer fight it really really is you know cody garbrandt's been one of my favorite bantamweights for a long time now and again, my opinions on Dillashaw naturally feed into my opinions on Garbrandt and what's happened before. But either way, that's going to be an insane fight. And Rob Font is really slapped on. In fact, I'm surprised that to the degree that he is slapped on. So that's going to be a really good fight. And whoever wins this fight, God willing, it does happen. They're going to throw their name into the title mix very, very strongly. So do not sleep in that fight at all. Yep, absolutely. And speaking of a killer fight, we have a killer co-main event for this upcoming fight night. And Giga Chikadze, a very up-and-coming contender in the UFC, facing UFC legend Cub Swanson. Hunter, what do you think? Who do you think wins this fight? When we look at Giga Chikadze, I feel like we 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 get him overlooked by Kevin Holland. You know, Kevin Holland had five fights in 2020. Giga had like four fights in 2020, and they were all wins once again. And the last one came by knockout in the first round. This guy is, is, is something special. He's a fantastic fighter. He's fun to watch. He's not just like, I'm going to win by points and whatnot. No, he goes for the finish every single time he steps, steps in the octagon. But this challenge he faces ahead is going to be his hardest one yet with Cub Swanson, a gritty veteran who's coming off a fantastic knockout win over another up-and-coming uh, uh, UFC star. Uh, he fought uh, Daniel Pineda, P- Pineda, who has fantastic knockout power, and has taken his hardest hits and kept moving forward and then ended up getting a beautiful one-two knockout followed up by a ground strike, which yeah. was amazing to see. I, and I, I was so happy to see him win because Cub Swanson is such a nice guy inside and outside of the octagon. He shows sportsmanship, and he's really fought everyone. He's fought the best of the best. He's, he's beaten Dustin Poirier. He's fought Max Holloway. He's fought, he's fought so many different people. And I just can't wait to see him back in the octagon. So – Prediction time. I think uh, I think Cub Swanson has what it takes to 
to keep this winning streak going for himself. Uh, he does have a bit of a liability when it comes to his leg because he's had surgery on it a few times. And uh, we saw in his last fight that the leg kicks were really coming through for Pineda. So uh, if um, Giga is able to um, leg kick Cub Swanson a whole lot to the point where he can't walk, I think Giga definitely has his fight under the, under the, under the, uh, the, the belt. But um, I think I have Cub Swanson winning by around three knockout. Yeah, Giga Chikadze and Cub Swanson really is the up-and-comer against the old gunslinger, mm-hmm. and you just love to see that kind of narrative. You know, Cub Swanson's one of the biggest legends of the 145 division, and he has been for a decade or more. You know, everybody loves him. I don't think there's a single person that dislikes him. is a very impressive up-and-comer. Like Hunter said, his last fight, got a finish, always goes for the knockout. And who does this remind us of? His opponent, Cub Swanson. It is old versus, old, not old versus young, it's experience against youth, up-and-comer versus established. And I think it's going to be a very intriguing chess match, actually. You know, it's going to be a real feeling out process because they're two guys who fight very similarly. But as Hunter said, Cub Swanson's susceptibility is that leg. As long as he can protect that leg and check any leg kicks that go towards it, I think based on experience, that will be Cub Swanson's fight to lose because he's got the octagon ship. He has the experience in droves. I mean, just think of the fighters Hunter's just listed that he's gone up against and beaten and gone in very tough fights with. So Giga Chikadze has got a very, very bright future but I think Cub Swanson keeps his win streak going as well. And I'm going to agree with Hunter, third round finish. Ooh, I'm going to have to disagree with you guys. I like Giga Chikaze in this fight. Um, I, I, he is one of those guys. Yes, he is young and octagon experience, but he is a legend in, I believe, kickboxing. I could be wrong, but he has fought yeah. like hundreds of fights in either kickboxing or Muay Thai or, or one of those. I believe he's kickboxing. You can see him in there. Whenever he fights, he is so intelligent on the feet. It, it, what he does and everything, he is an elite striker already at this division, um, which is why against Cub Swanson is going to be a really fun fight because we all know how good Cub Swanson is on the feet as well. I agree with what Hunter said and what Keelan said too. His last fight against Pineda was amazing. I loved it so much. I love Cub Swanson. Everybody loves Cub Swanson. Uh, just to see him win and win like that, it's amazing. And if he beats Giga Chikadze, I mean, he's catching, what, uh, like a fifth win in his career now? Who knows? Yeah, yeah. He's going to keep getting ranked opponents because it's a huge fight for both of these guys. This this fight's going to be amazing. I'm so excited. This is a crazy f- co-main event for a fight night. These guys are going to go out there and throw bombs. We're looking at a potential fight of the night. Uh, well, I say fight of the night. There's so many good fights on this card. Um, I, I – it's going to be an amazing fight. You have to watch it. It's two legends on the feet and stand up. Um, Cub Swanson will have octagon experience, which is interesting. If he if he is um, getting a little bit outmatched on the feet, he will be able to mix it up, and we'll really get to see how Giga Chikadze's uh, wrestling and grappling is against Cub Swanson just from the clinch alone. And we all know how good Cub Swanson is off of the clinch as well. He can land those short hooks and everything, which gives him the mm-hmm. advantage. But that being said, I like Giga in this fight. I like those kicks. I really like those head kicks, those leg kicks, everything. I think he chops Cub Swanson down to a uh, a close but but pretty decisive decision for uh, Giga Chikadze is my prediction. I like it. I like it. You know, I have no complaints from that decision or that uh that evaluation because Giga is no no one to be slept on here because all the kickboxing experience that he has. But this we got to realize is an MMA fight, and Cub yeah. Swanson has such a great fight IQ that if he realizes he's losing on the feet, he'll switch it up and he'll go for the takedown because. People sleep on his wrestling skills. He's got fantastic grappling. We've seen it in plenty of this fight beforehand. So if he feels like he's losing, I feel like he can go to the ground. And if he wants to keep it standing, he can keep it standing. But those leg kicks really are going to take a factor in this fight. It's going to make it or break the fight. So I don't have really any complaints for that one. But I just think I envision it a little bit more. I think uh, I think Cub Swanson can land the hit the harder shots. And um, he has more finishes. Uh, but then again, he has also been in the UFC for a way longer. So... There's that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think Cub Swanson round three knockout. I'm going to still hold by that, but I really do like Jack's prediction too. Yeah, I like Jack's prediction as well. I am not mad at that whatsoever. I think it's the best argument you can actually make for Giga Chikatsi in this fight. Uh, That being said, 
I think the experience will be shown in this fight. I think Cub Swanson will probably dictate the tempo a lot more than his last couple of fights. And, you know, when you look at someone like Cub Swanson, for my money, you put him in the list of the original BMFs alongside yeah. Gilbert Melendez, Diego Sanchez, guys of this caliber. So, you know, like Jack said, he this man's getting a fifth wind in his career. He has been around multiple blocks, not just the block. So he's going to know what to do in this fight. And what I love about Cub Swanson is that he doesn't have any ego. He's not going to stand and trade for the sake of it if he thinks he's losing to try and prove a point. If he thinks he's losing, he will level change and he will switch it up. He might use his Muay Thai against the cage, throwing some dirty boxing there against a guy like Chikadze, or he might take it to the ground and he is capable of keeping it there. So this fight's going to be a very good litmus test of Chikadze and where he's at at the moment. And like so many fights in this card, it is going to be criminally slapped on. Make sure you're not one of them that does. Yeah, and we all know he still has his power too, which is interesting as well. Mm-hmm. So amazing co-main event leading to another amazing fight. Our main event, a lot at stake in the light heavyweight division as Dominic Reyes steps in against Yuri Prohajka. Hunter, who wins it? This is going to be such a fun fight to watch. I mean, we have the number three ranked Dominic Reyes who put on a five-round controversial loss to John Jones. And a lot of people saw him winning. And then he yeah. goes out and gets KO'd by... Uh, Jan Blachowicz, as we all know, and then has a uh, a kind of a close, close, another close kind of loss under his belt. So this fight right here is his, his jump back fight, but this is going to be no easy test. This is Yuri Prohaska, all right? Now, a lot of UFC people don't know him, but if you look at other organizations, you realize that this is no joke. This may be his second fight in the UFC, but it's already his first main event for his second fight. This has to tell you that this guy is no one to be slept on. Yuri Prohaska has such an unusual style about him, too. He kind of runs around the cage. He goes in and out of the pocket. When I watch him fight, I'm reminded of how uh, of Tony Ferguson. You know, they just do such weird things in the octagon. But once again, you can't sleep on Tony. You can't sleep on Yuri because out of nowhere, he'll get the knockout. And he'll just go in and out of the pocket. And he is a fantastic fighter. Record of 27-3 and three with the second fight in the UFC. Like, this guy is crazy. So... What I'm going to say here is Yuri Prohaska by probably second round knockout. Interesting. I like it a lot. As Hunter said, you know, a lot of people will not know who he is, but Yuri Prohaska is a very unconventional and unorthodox fighter. You know, if you've seen his fights, he throws from different angles. Like Hunter said, he moves in and out of the pocket very unconventionally. A lot of his movement to me is actually very reminiscent of Michel Pereira. at 185 and 170 that was the comparison that i drew the first time i saw him and i was very impressed with how he did it because you know he didn't throw in cartwheels and so on and so forth he actually utilized his unique ability very effectively and it's going to be a very real issue for dominic reyes when he faces him on saturday night you know dominic reyes needs no introduction like we said that five round fight against john jones which I did have Jones winning, but I would not have been mad if you judged Reyes winning either. It was one of those very close fights. And then he goes out and he gets flatlined by the Polish power of Jan Blakovic. Now, the Blakovic fight is very relevant in this analysis because you have a fighter in Yuri Brahashka who brings such a unique style. And Reyes struggled massively with orthodox boxing. How is he going to cope with unorthodox striking and unique angles and moving in and out of the pocket and switching it up? And I do think it's going to be a real problem for Dominic Reyes. You know, this is very different to the fight we just broke down there now with Cub Swanson and that Reyes does very much of the experience over Brahashka, but he struggles with the style that he faces. And I think Brahashka is actually going to utilize that weakness very effectively I have, hmm, I'm going to say third round knockout for Yuri Bahajka. I think he's going to come in. He's going to catch Reyes with something that he just won't see coming. Maybe an unorthodox elbow from the clinch or something like that. But I think Yuri Bahajka could very well make a real statement with this fight. Yeah. Ooh, it's going to be a good one. This is such an interesting fight because Reyes needs this win. 
Uh, yes, he, he does. He has a fire lit under him. He needs this win. So you know for a fact he's 100% focused on this fight, preparing for this fight. We're going to see the best Dominic Reyes. We know that for a fact. Yuri Prohoshka, second find the UFC is in a main event. Any guy that flatlines Volkan Ozdemir like that, you know he's legit. And Volkan Ozdemir was fighting well in that fight as, as well against uh, Yuri Prohoshka early. Um, but Yuri is just a monster. He clipped him back. They were both. That was a crazy fight. They were both rock. But Yuri Prohoshka, that weird style, but the power in his hands is unreal. Um, this guy is already. I, he's he obviously has experience outside the UFC. Kind of like Giga Chikadze, he's a very, very good striker. I won't call him elite yet because I haven't seen him that much in the UFC. He's on the verge of being elite. If he knocks out Dan, uh, uh, Dominic Reyes, um, I, I call him elite, especially in the light heavyweight division. Um, Dom, yeah, but Dominic Reyes, well, I want, okay, you predicted, I think Yuri Prohoshka wins as well by a knockout. Um, Hunter said round two, Keelan said round three, Salman said round one. I don't think he's going to go out there and just smoke Dominic Reyes. But if it does happen, <laughs> I'll look like a genius. So uh, Yuri Prohoshka, <laughs> hey, round one is, is my thing. But what I want to see is Dominic Reyes weather the storm a little bit. Maybe he drops a couple rounds to Yuri and he goes to the championship rounds uh, in, in this main event. That is what I want to see because we haven't seen – I mean, this is his second fight, but, like, with the style and everything, can he keep that style up for five rounds or at least four rounds or three rounds before the gas starts to fade? And once the gas starts to fade, we know Reyes picks it up later in the fight. So – I don't know. That's what I want to see. I want to see Reyes stick in there and see what happens. But um, I, I'm going to go Yuri knockout uh, round one. Uh, should be a good one. I'm, I'm very excited. Stakes are high. Though we've all said Prohaska is going to win. I don't think it's it's definitely not impossible for Dominic Reyes. To no, win here. Yeah. not at all. Here's the blueprint for, for him to do it. We saw in Yuri's last fight against Volkan Odesimir, Volkan was landing good leg kicks back and forth. every or The first round, he landed a good like, like at least like eight to ten clean leg kicks and you yeah. saw it was starting to bother him towards the end of the first round and then the beginning of the second round that's when your uh Volkan Odesimir got knocked out Dominic Reyes is fantastic with leg kicks we saw this in the Jan fight sadly um the first fight or the first round when we saw it he was kicking Jan's legs really well and as an inside and you saw it was starting to bother Jan too if these fights are starting to go the distance a little bit more and more and if he could survive the power of Yuri I feel like Dominic Reyes can edge out Yuri but if Yuri does keep to his style and starts checking these leg kicks, then most definitely I think Yuri can get this knockout here. But Dominic Reyes should not be slept on. And the blueprint for his success are these through the leg kicks, kind of like the co main event. These leg kicks are going to make or break the fight. The problem Dominic Reyes has is, is that his leg kicks are his greatest weapon, but they're also right. a huge weakness against That's a guy true. like Yuri Bahajka. And this That's is why if you know, we've all seen Dominic Reyes' last few fights. And when you notice him fighting in a particular stance, when he throws that leg kick, he drops his hand from his chin a lot. And that's been a big weakness in his game for a long time. And that was actually how John Jones got back into their fight by landing the jabs and the hooks from there. And that's really that was really the build up to Jan Blakovic shattering him in their fight too. And the chin is a real suspect issue for me with Dominic Reyes. It is very suspect, not only because he's prone to getting hit there, but he's been hit flush by Jan Blakovic, and Blakovic breaks jaws with his punches. He broke Rockhold's jaw, and he seriously damaged Dominic Reyes's. And if Yuri Bahajka can land clean technique on that chin, then I don't know if I can see Reyes weathering the storm. In fact, I think those that's what this fight's going to come down to, those two weapons. It's going to come down to but to Bahajka's boxing ability towards Reyes's chin, and it's going to be Reyes's leg kicks on Bahajka. And whichever fighter can implement that respective game plan first is probably the winner of this fight on Saturday night. Yeah, I really like that assessment, actually. I, I could see Prohajka just raiding Reyes early and just bombing him and Reyes really that's such a hard style to counter kind of like Jan Blakovich obviously not to the extent but just a guy that's literally running at you and, and trying to land thing after thing after thing and then the minute he gets a break Dominic Reyes is going to be like okay now I'm going to land something good technique is a leg kick or whatever and he likes to load up on those leg kicks and they work mm. whenever you set them up but if you don't set them up and you just throw it, which you like. That's a bad tendency that he has. That you point out, Keelan. It's a very good point. Um, he doesn't set up the leg kicks very often. Now, they're very powerful whenever they do land because of that, that he doesn't set them up because he's able to full-on step in and, and kick it. But the, the downside to that is if he fully commits to that, especially after he just survived 
a barrage from Yuri Prohoshka, well, he's going to get countered and hit again. And if you get hit, hit with your when you're off balance, that's when you guys get knocked out. Not whenever they see a punch coming, or even if they don't see a punch coming, it's when they're off balance because balance is a large part of where their chin is. Um, and that's, that is where he would get caught. And I could see that happening. That's a great point, actually. Um, so the last little bit for this podcast is a fan question from one of Keelan's guys, Evan Vick. He asks, um, if Usman goes out and cleans the 170 pound division, what would a unification bout against Douglas Lima of Bellator look like? Hunter, what do you think? This would be amazing to watch. I mean, it, it, it's such a fun fight to always see across when a promotional fights you know um we've, we've seen it happen very very rarely in the past but if we saw this happen nowadays i mean we wouldn't be complaining you know any anytime kamaru is going to be stepping in the octagon in the future i would love to see and douglas lima whenever he steps in i guess it, it's like a circle in Bellator, yeah <laughs> um whenever he steps in it's always fun to watch especially when he's knocking his opponents out like he did for uh, mvp so um this fight how it's going to turn out though we saw it in Douglas Lima's last fight that he is susceptible to wrestling. You know, he went up against Gegard Mousasi, tried getting the become the champ champ in a uh, Bellator, and he, he fell short from it because of wrestling and and, and really um, dominant just grappling skills coming from Musasi. So, if Kamaru Usman wanted to, he can take this to the ground and he can just smother him with with um, punches and and swarms and even submission attempts, but. Um, I don't think Kamaru Usman even needs to do that. I think his boxing and his jab has become so good nowadays that he can take on the likes of Lima and he can he can dominate Lima in this fight. I feel like this fight would be fun to watch, but I feel like I would see Kamaru Usman winning any way possible. Yeah, first of all, thank you to my guy, Ivandro, for the question. Yeah. We appreciated it a lot. Amazing scenario to lay out for welterweight, for sure. Um, it's very hard to disagree with what Hunter's just said there. You know, I mean, Douglas Lima is a beast. Let's lay that out first and foremost. I don't think that's saying anything new. You know, he fought a guy who was very tricky in Michael Venom Page and flattened them. Yeah, yeah. As in that's crazy about that. flattened Michael Venom Page, you know, limp, unconscious, flattened them. Um, and, you know, the thing is, we do not see cross-promotional fights very often at all. And it is sad because, you know, back in the days of, like, Pride, it was amazing to see those cross-promotional fights when the UFC was coming up. The most recent cross-promotional fight I remember, I think, was Darian Caldwell of Bellator going to Japan to fight somebody. That might have been a year or two ago. That's the most recent one I can remember. But, you know, I think Kamaru Usman's got a very real chance of wiping out the 170 division. And to beat Kamaru, you would probably have to look across to other promotions for new challenges. And Douglas Lima hits like a semi-truck. But the problem is Kamaru Usman is just getting better and better and more powerful with every fight that comes. In fact, I would almost draw the comparison that Kamaru Usman is becoming the Thanos of welterweight mixed martial arts. And what I mean by that is, you know, everybody thinks they have the answer to the chink in his armor. And he goes out and he just proves everybody wrong every single time. And, you know, he just gets better and better and faster and stronger with every single fight. And being a champion, you could almost forgive a fighter for having an off fight or two. For example, John Jones has had a few of them. Kamaru Usman has not had a single off fight since he got that belt. He's gone out and he's, with the exception of Colby Covington, he's pretty much smoked every fighter that's come across his path. Now, the Lima fight would be incredible to watch. I think it would be fireworks, but I think Kamaru Usman would smother him. You know, Douglas Lima is a big guy, but Kamaru is a huge welterweight fighter first and foremost, and his wrestling is the best in any welterweight division in the world for my money at this point. And, you know, if Douglas Lima could keep that fight standing, I think he would have every chance because those leg kicks of Lima's especially are deadly. They almost have the same effect that Anthony Smith's had against Jimmy Crute last weekend. They blow people's knees out. The problem is Kamaru Usman would probably have him on the ground before he threw one, or he would use that thrown leg kick to enter into a single leg to take him down and keep him there. So I would love to watch it, but in answer to my friend Evander's question, 
I think it would still be Kamar Usman. The boxing is better. The job, Lima probably wouldn't be able to get past that. And even if he did, I don't see Lima taking Usman down either. So I think Usman would have all bases covered. Yeah, great question. Thank you so much. Um, I, I agree with you guys. Uh, I, I just don't, I mean, first off, this is a little bit off topic, but Hunter got me thinking. I want to give a massive shout out to Gegar Mutasi. Uh, obviously, Bellator is 185 champion. I think he was taken away from the UFC. Uh, obviously, he, he, Bellator offered him a great deal and everything, uh, and all the respect to him. And he pr- went out there and proved that he is the best in their, in their weight class. But he was taken too early from us in the UFC. He was really starting to get going and proving that he was one of the best 185ers on the planet. I would love to see a Gegard Mousasi uh, a unification bout with whoever the champion. I think Robert Whitaker versus Gegard Mousasi would be a fantastic Ooh. fight. Now, I know Gegard's a little bit older in his career, a prime Gegar Mousasi. I, I guess he is technically still in his prime, but a, a little bit younger. I mean, that would be, I, I would still love to see that. I do think he is, he was, especially, and still is, but especially whenever he first became Bellator champion, he, I think he legitimately could have been the best um, 185 around the planet. When Michael Bisping was the champ at the UFC and Gegar Mousasi was champ at Bellator, that fight right there would have proved who was the best 185 around the planet. So, a little aside right there, but massive shout out to Gegar Mousasi because I loved watching you fight, and I, I still do, obviously, in Bellator. Um, so, Douglas Lima, I mean, you guys already nailed it. Great fighter. Uh, just all around hands hands of steel, I mean, hands of stone, whatever. It, he, he hits people hard. <laughs> uh, he will knock people out. We have never seen MVP got, like, even really hurt that badly, and he just completely smoked him. I mean, those leg kicks to, to just – I don't know if you've seen the Thor hammer edit where he just hits them and everything, too. It's just – it's accurate. I mean, it's amazing. Um, so that's why I want to hype him up before saying that I don't think he stands a chance against Kamaru Usman. Uh, Kamaru was just so good. I mean, look what he just did. He just knocked out Jorge Masvidal. He knocked out Gilbert Burns. Completely ragdolled Jorge Masvidal the first time. Ragdolled um, Tyron Woodley, who was elite. And a, a lot of people didn't see uh, Tyron Woodley losing the belt to Kamaru Usman. Kamaru Usman's on another level right now. Has the best of the best coaching behind him. Keeps improving every single fight. Um, so I don't, I don't want to trash Doug, Douglas Lima or anything. He's a fantastic fighter, but Usman... 10 times out of 10 in that fight for me. Um, that's just what I'm thinking. Yeah, no, I agree. I don't really see much that uh, Douglas Lima could do, but we do, he does have his hands of steel and he has fantastic leg kicks. When you're kicking a tree, it's not going to do much damage. I feel like Kamaru Usman's got some tree chunk legs. Yeah. And I mean, you're going to need a, a thousand kicks to make him wobble, which is definitely possible. Don't get me wrong. If you hit him in the right spot, like Anthony Smith did, you can take him out of the fight immediately. But, um, yeah, I only see Douglas Lima winning one way, and that's by knockout, which is possible, but it would have to be in the first or second round because Kamaru Usman has some championship-style cardio, too. We saw it in the uh, um, Colby Covington fight. He can go to those championship rounds, and he could still throw with extreme power, and, and he throws with volume, too. He keeps, he, he'll keep throwing if he sees an opportunity to strike. He's not going to just sit there and take a breath and whatever, no. If he sees the opportunity, he's going to strike, and he will strike hard. Kamaru Usman has, just has the ability, and he has, I feel like, more tools than Douglas Lima has in this case. So, well, yeah, my answer doesn't change. Uh, Kamaru Usman. Yeah, Kamaru Usman is just an insanely well-rounded fighter. Even, like I said in the last podcast we did, even when he had no hands, he was still the best welterweight. So what does he know that he has serious hands? And the truth is, Lima would just be having nightmares about the Nigerian nightmare. There's a reason he's called that. Um, yeah, I think Lima's only real shot would be to try and blow out Kamaru Usman at the legs. Yeah. And like Hunter said, when you have tree trunk legs, it's even harder than it would have been before. You know, you'd have to target, I can't remember the specific name, but you'd have to target that nerve that runs behind the knee. And even with that, Kamaru Usman so damn good at checking leg kicks too. Even in the Covington fight, I think Usman checked every single leg kick Covington through in the first three or four rounds. So I just think 10 times out of 10, Kamaru Usman would do him. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that. And another thing too is y- y- I don't think you can land a, a thousand leg kicks against Kamaru Usman, even if he checks them. I'm not even I'm not even counting checks. I think he grabs the leg and takes you down if you throw it up there that many times. And the higher you throw the kick, the slower it's going to be as well. And if you're targeting that nerve, that's not the calf. And now again, the calf kicks would do damage, but Kamaru Usman knows how to time that. He knows how to time that. And again, we talked about countering leg kicks as well. We just we now we know 
Kamaru Usman has elite knockout power. That one two is deadly. Um, it's just it's just a bad matchup. But I think that'll do it for this podcast. Again, thank you for the fan question. Amazing podcast, guys. Thank you, everyone, so much for listening. Please make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube. Listen to us everywhere, including iTunes and Spotify. Please make sure to follow us on Instagram at MMA.Island and check out all of our work on our website, MMAIsland.net. Again, thank you, everyone, so much for listening. Amazing podcast, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Can't wait to see you all again soon. Um,